Rosh Hashiva, we are standing by the place where we look up. This is where the glory of the temple once stood, but yet we decided to go all the way down to the rubble, where we see the destruction and we feel the destruction, but really all in trying to understand how did this happen? How did we go from such a beautiful, magnificent building that we see the remnants of it to the destruction that we're still living within it? This is not just a beautiful building. This was where God's presence was felt. The Shechina was here. It was the center of the nation. The Jewish nation flourished. All of us were here together. The destruction meant our dispersion over all the world. The unwelcome guests of every civilization on the face of this earth. What made it happen? So the rabbis tell us. The rabbis tell us what happened. The Gemara says, the Talmud relates. Sinas China. Baseless hatred. Baseless hatred. Do you know of anyone that hates for no reason? Usually it's because we're upset at something. What is baseless? Okay. So let, let, <laughs> let, really let's go back. <laughs> let's go back in history. What was the baseless hatred? There was civil war. You know, at the time of the destruction of the temple, the Romans found themselves, I mean, dealing with three different armies. The nation first and foremost was split over whether or not to fight the Romans. The Romans at that point did not have a religion, they did not have a philosophy. All they wanted to do was rule over the world. The question is, do you fight, do you risk your lives for nationalism when your values are not threatened? The Romans would have tolerated the Beis Hamikdash, the temple, to remain with all the rituals, Torah study, Everything that was important to us, they would have allowed all that with one condition, the Roman eagle be atop everything and taxes be paid to Rome. So there was a dispute, and that turned into civil war. Jew killing Jew. Okay, so I, I understand that it went too far, but didn't it start with people fighting for what they believed was right? Ah, oh, so here's, here's the answer. Baseless hatred means, not that it started from nothing, I just hate someone's guts. Baseless hatred begins with something ideological often, but then it turns into personal hatred. Jews always argue. Every Jew, every Jew is a truth seeker. Every Jew is opinionated. Everyone's got their own neshama. Every soul is different. Every personality is different. Different ways of looking at things. Yeah, so we argue, and that's beautiful. It's a common search for truth. We're intelligent people. Things matter to us. But when that turns into personal hatred, that is the tragedy of the Jewish nation. We are so splintered. We are so, so splintered, all the way to the point that so many Jews don't even want to identify Jewish. There isn't a single organization that still exists in its original form. I would, I would dare to say that the majority of synagogues, of shuls, are breakaways from another one. Right. Yeshiva, this, everything, everything, everything great in the Jewish nation is a piece of another thing. It's a breakaway. We just can't keep things together. And people hate each other. You can disagree. You gotta disagree. You're Jewish. You gotta have an opinion. But to hate, that's poisonous. To hate, that's destruction. How do we keep our own opinions and identity, but not bring it to this destruction? not bring it to where, where we were shattered and, sp and splintered all over the world. Jews are expected to be mature. Maturity means you can disagree to the death, but you love. You gotta love Jews. You gotta love Jews, that's it. You gotta love Jews, we're in this together. You can't hate. Disagree, yes. You can't love someone you disagree with. You can't be there for someone you disagree with. What do you got to hate for? That, that's destruction. I'll tell you something. This was only a sign of the real destruction. The real destruction was when we destroyed ourselves by hating one another. And that's true to this very day. The Jewish nation is filled with destruction because it's filled with hatred. We've got to learn to love. No, you don't have to agree with anybody. 
we don't compromise in our values. No, everyone disagrees. Fight, argue, argue with love. With love, care. Be there for everybody. Wow. No, I, I, honestly, do people enjoy hating? It makes us feel good. Well, why do we that. do this to ourselves? Why do we do this first? Why do we do this to ourselves? People want to feel that they're right more than they want to. I guess, I don't know, I guess that feeling over, overrides everything. I you want to feel like I'm right. You don't yeah. convince anyone that you're right by hating. Hatred certainly is not the way to convince anybody of anything. It's ineffective. It doesn't work. Why do we do it? It's immaturity. It's nothing other than maturity. It's, it's being simplistic. It's the easy way. It's the easy, as painful as it is, but we don't think. It's the easy way of dealing with another opinion. Dismiss it because you hate the person. He doesn't exist. Hi, my name is Rabbi Steve Berg, and I'm the CEO of Aish. As you just heard, we sit just a few feet away from the rubble that once was the Holy Temple, the Beit HaMikdash. And we sit here and we invite people all the time to come in and to try and rebuild their relationship with the Almighty. Because that's what today is all about. Tisha B'Av is about a distance between us and the Almighty. And how do we bridge that, that gap and come back together? But it's not only about that relationship. It's also about the relationship that we have with each other. We all know that there's no greater pain in the world than someone feels when a parent feels for their children. When their children are arguing, there's tremendous pain. It's the same thing with the Almighty. When Jews are fighting with one another, then they're not able to accomplish the goal that they set forth to do to make the world a better place. And so today we focus on each other. We're gonna hear some incredible educators tell us how to do that. Really work through how to fall, re-fall in love with each other. And eventually, as the Jews get stronger together and become that light unto the nation, then the next step to the Almighty will be that much easier. God will look down from heaven, smile upon us, and embrace us. Thank you all for being here today with us. And I hope that you will take these important lessons and incorporate them into your daily lives. Very often uh, couples come to speak to me and they're talking to me about their difficulties and at a certain point I get all confused. I'm like, what's it, what are we fighting about here exactly? What, 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 what's, what's the disagreement? What, what's going on? And they can't even like, tell me how it all started. They don't even understand what happened. So I always like to share the following idea. The word for peace in Hebrew is shalom. Everyone knows the word shalom. 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 The first letter of Shalom, Shin, has three branches. On top, everything is separate. You have the left, the right, the center. The last letter is the Mem, is a connected, four lines all connected, it's all one. So how do you get from the Shin, from the three separate directions, to the Mem, to that perfect unity, the harmony? So in the middle, you have the Lamid and the Vav. The letter Lamid is the tallest letter and it looks above, it points above all the other letters. When you're able to lift yourself above and beyond the nitty gritty, the pettiness, the, the little gay, okay, this person borrowed this and they give it back, like the little things that are so irrelevant, so unimportant. When you're able to lift yourself above that and look forward, look at what's important. Where are we going? What are we doing? What's the point of all this? And then the next letter is the vav. The vav in Hebrew means and. You're able to connect, because we're connecting on what's important. What are our values? We forget about all the nonsense. So then we're able to achieve the mem at the end, the perfect unity. Sometimes we all get caught up in such stupidity. It's so dumb. And then it escalates into this grand 
issue, like we're, we're world war. And if we would just be able to take a step back and say, why are we fighting again? No one even remembers. But we're able to realign ourselves. What are we looking to do? Where are we going? What are we doing? And then based on that, connect, we'll be able to achieve that incredible unity. Unity to me is, is a big word, but actually a very small action that makes a massive difference. Now unity doesn't mean that we all need to be the same. We are all different. And if you see that every single person's finger, they have five fingers on each hand, every single one has a different tip because we're all different. We might look the same, but we're all different. We have different struggles. We have different purposes. We have each, each of, us, of us has an individual ladder that we need to climb up to achieve, to, to get to what we need to achieve in this world. We were put here for a reason. And unity actually is so simple. Like I said at the beginning, it sounds like it's so simple. Just have unity. Just accept people for who they are. You know, if somebody else does something that's wrong, it's not my business. So why is it such a difficult thing? Why are both of the temples were destroyed? Because we had sinat chinam. We had baseless hatred to each other. We couldn't accept each other. We couldn't love each other for who they are. We couldn't wish the best for each other. We constantly have this hatred inside of us. And I think it's crazy because it's not even like somebody's asked you now to give $10,000. No one asked you, Dina, to give me $10,000. Unity is an easy thing. It, it really sounds so easy, and yet it's so difficult. And I think the reason is it's so difficult is because it touches the me. And when I want to have unity, then it means I need to accept people for who they are. My ego may be put aside. And the problem is we are so... As I said at the beginning, we don't have unity with ourselves. We're so busy with thinking of how can I feel better from the external, so the, inter the, the, the internal kind of gets completely forgotten. I once heard this really interesting idea that in order to achieve unity, you have to be a little colorblind. Mm -hmm. When you start noticing who looks different, what they, how they look different than you, it takes away. We have to look at, for commonality and not for differences. And yeah. I think that's really what you're pointing at, which is so, so important. Yeah, I think that as, uh, as Jewish people, because, because the only way that we can survive as Jews is if we have unity, then the yetzerara, the, the, the negative energy that wants to always make us fail and doesn't want us to, to succeed in anything that we do and, and, and not make us productive, is constantly going to be that voice that's going to say, like you said before, about being colorblind, oh, look at that person, look at what they're doing, look how they spoke, look what they didn't do. And that's that negative energy that's constantly going to want to put us down because as Jewish people, if we don't have unity, we, I'm, I'm going to say it again and again, we can't survive. There's nothing greater than the nachat, the, the pleasure that a parent gets when they see that their kids are unified. Do they all look the same? Not in my family. Do they all wear the same? Not in my family. When you have unity and you have that self-care for each other um, and for the ones around, then, then that's, that's, that's the greatest um, happiness that a parent can have. And to the opposite, it's the greatest sadness is when you have two siblings um, or a family that they don't get on for whatever reason it is, for probably usually for something very silly and for something that's probably not very, very important. There seems to be this misconception that unity and peace, that means agreement. Are you kidding? That everyone thinks the same way? That's not unity, that's not peace, that's dull. You know, ever hear of a marriage where husband and wife agree on everything? That's a dull marriage. You know what peace is? Peace is when people disagree and they learn, they learn to make it work. They learn to make it work because they care about one another. That's what Jews are supposed to be like. We have to make it work. We respect one another. We disagree to the death, but we respect one another and we care and we make it work. That's what unity is. Yeah, I, I think what the Rosh Hashiva, what the Rosh Hashiva is saying is how I understand what achdus is as opposed to what we say achidut. Echad means that we're all the same. Achdut is not that we're the same, but we're able to unite and together it creates one wholesome. We become one, but only through a lot of different people that are coming together. Not that we're necessarily the same person. Different teams, different parts of the team, different units in the army are all able to form one cohesive army. And I think that's, that's very powerful for us to, to take home. Also, Shalom Imrovav, Hashem makes peace up in heaven. How does it make peace in heaven? So, yeah, 
during the plague of hail. It was ice and fire together. together. That, that's, that's real harmony. That's peace. That's peace. Peace is not one piece of ice. Peace is ice with fire. The, the truth is, this question is so powerful and so important. There's an astonishing verse in the Bible. Astonishing, where God says to, to, to the humanity and to the Jewish people, listen, you know what? The most important thing is you guys get along. I don't even care. I, I don't even care. Serve idols. Even if you be, even if you, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be, do, you wouldn't be the most religious people. Even if you're, you're, you know, you, you don't see eye to eye and everything else. Yes. Astonishing that God would say, would say that. It's that important to Him. Because if we can't get along, this whole world is it falls apart. Our family falls apart. Humanity falls apart. I think one of the keys to unity is having a common goal. If we're all working towards the same thing, we just had an Aish football team and we played many other yeshivas and there were some groups from East Jerusalem, Arab groups and Christian groups and groups from Tel Aviv. And you noticed in the team at half time, everyone gets around together and it's we're in it together. Let's do this together. So if we've got a common goal, then we all play our role in the team then we're not competing with each other because as soon as we're competing with each other we're not going to reach our common goal because once we want the same thing then we're in it for each other and that's what creates unity amongst the team. We, we all need to feel accepted and respected so that's that's what we need to do you know sometimes I go to the holy to the Kotel I see people you know they kiss the, the prayer book and sometimes the prayer book falls on the floor and you see someone like rushing to pick it up and kiss it and I say that's very nice how about how about we pick up another Jew from the floor and kiss them? How about we pick up another person from the floor and kiss them? Or at least let's not push them over onto them. <laughs> there are two different types of people. There are people I put myself down and you're so great. That's not healthy. You have to have a se healthy sense of self and self-respect. And we're going to uplift other people, but we're going to be working together to always uplift each other once we have the same goal in mind. The, the, the question of what is Achtos, what is unity, is a, is a grand question. It's a very big question. I heard a beautiful idea based off the teachings of the oral tradition known as the Mishnah. We're looking, overlooking here, the Western Wall, the Kotel, which right beyond is where we had the temple. We have the Temple Mount over there. And, and uh, we know that there were certain holidays when during the prayer service, there's so many people there. We had, we had the, the men coming from all over the world would come to this place right over here. And the words of the Mishnah is Om Dim Tzifufim. When they would be standing, they'd be like shoulder to shoulder. It would be very Tzafufim. It would be very crowded. But when they said the name of God, they would all bow down. And the words of the Mishnah, of this teaching, is Mishtachavim Revachim. When they would bow miraculously, even though when they stood there, they just stuck together, but when they would bow, there was enough room for everybody to bow, complete prostration, their whole body lying out on the floor. And the idea which I heard was so wow. beautiful is that if we are omade, we stand on this is the principle of the matter and this is what I believe in, then the world becomes very tzafuf, it becomes very crowded. But if you're able to be mishtachavev, you're able to bow, if you're able to lower yourself and say, and give to someone else, then revachim, there's space for everyone. The question is whether we're willing to take a few steps back, whether we're willing to bow, or I must stand on the principle of the matter. The choice is yours. Why did God create differences and, 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 and people are so unique and isn't that, doesn't that create tension and is, relationships are a minefield? Yeah, that's what makes us great. You know, that's exactly, that God created differences between people in order to challenge us to overcome those, overcome those differences, in order to challenge us to, to, to become great, to become more selfless and less selfish. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. We're in this world to build ourselves. We're in this world to earn our existence. That's what it's all about. The fact that we naturally don't get along is one of our greatest challenges. 
And that's where you can build yourself. That is our chance for greatness. That's our chance for greatness. The world was created imperfect for the sake of serving that perfect purpose of giving us the opportunity to build it. And there's no better place than when it comes to relationships. There's just no better place. Meaning at the end of the day, we have to, when we come in with the mindset that it's for our good, so it will help us put on the right lens. It, it reminds me of the famous passage in the Talmud. It says that the conflict was created on the second day. And on the second day of creation, it doesn't say that the creation was good. But on the third day, it says twice that it's good. That's why everything about Jewish wisdom is number three. We were given the Torah, which is divided into three, Torah, Nevi'im, and Miksuvim, by the third uh, person, which is Moses, Moshe, who is the third child, on the third day, on the third month. And, and where Am Yisrael is divided into three. The number three, in a certain way, represents the coming together of the conflict. That we could be two different voices, but then we need to find the third option that brings it all out of us. God puts opportunities in front of you in order for you to grow. Mm -hmm. And the rabbis tell us that Rabbi Akiva was asked by the Roman um, emperor, he was asked, like, does your God love poor people? So Rabbi Akiva said, of course he loves poor people. So um, the Roman emperor says, well, then why doesn't he take care of them? Mm -hmm. And Rabbi Akiva says, the reason is so that we can take care of them. Beautiful. Anytime I run into somebody who's difficult or, or has certain needs, I have to say to myself, God could have solved this problem. And if he's sending this problem my way, it's because it's, I'm going to grow in the process. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of coined a phrase around this. I call it opportunity or annoyance. Right. When you run into a difficult person, is this an annoyance or is this an opportunity for my growth? Mm -hmm. And I think that's my answer to your question. God had to make relationships difficult so that we can stretch and grow because he wants us to become the best version of ourselves. And that only happens when you have a little challenge, a right. little sweat in the yeah. workout of relationships. Because if you're not sweating, you're not it's really funny growing. When, it's funny that you said the word sweat because I, uh, I do a lot of working up, do a lot of running. And I always say that when you, know, you, you go to the gym, you know, if I'd have a personal trainer that would uh, you know, give me the 10 kilos that I'm used to taking, then I wouldn't take that personal trainer again because they've not challenged me. You know, right. I would only use a personal trainer that looks at me and says, okay, yes, this is easy for you, but now you can, I could put on another kilo onto your weights because you'll be able to do it. Um, and as you say, it's an opportunity to be able to, you know, Fantastic. see somebody and say, okay, this is a bit challenging, but this is the way that I'm going to grow. That's this is the way that I'm going to I love that image. I'm imagining like the incline <laughs> on the interpersonal treadmill. Like, okay, this was getting too easy, and now we're going for the extra challenge. And whenever God sends you a difficult person, it's because you're ready for that, like, extra, the yeah. extra level. Yeah. I really like that. You don't always necessarily choose the people in your family. You know, you can choose a friend and say, that's too difficult for me. I don't want that one. I want this one. But your family members are the ones who, those are the ones who challenge you, and those are the ones who really, really help you grow if you take it as an opportunity. Completely, completely. Yeah. I want to tell you a story. There was a, uh, a great rabbi. His name was Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach. He lived just a 15-20 minute walk from where we are right now. And he got up at his wife's funeral and he said that it's customary to ask for forgiveness from the deceased. But I, and he said this in front of thousands of people, so we know this is a true story. He said, I have nothing to ask forgiveness for because everything that my wife and I did, the way we interacted with one another, is exactly the way it's supposed to be. Is that, yeah. is that amazing I like, to, to get like, to that? We've never fought. Like, we never had a fight or something. And I just want to tell you, when I heard the story, before we got married, you know, during the classes, groom classes, before we got married, I, I did not like this story. Because uh, it's, it's hard to live up to. Yeah, like yeah. baloney. Like, okay. like, so so listen, listen to this as a part two. I also felt that way. <laughs> and I re refused to share that story in public. I'm going to share with you part two, okay? A few years later, there was a, a student that Rabbi Orbach was uh, mentoring. And six months after his wedding, he went to the boy, the new uh, married man, and he said to him, he said, so how's your marriage going? So he said, Rabbi, it's amazing. We see eye to eye on everything. We haven't had one disagreement. It's awesome. So the rabbi turns to him, he says, did your wife die? So the, the young man was like very taken aback. He's like, Rabbi, I just told you, it's amazing. We see eye to eye in everything. We agree on everything. It's, it's, it's awesome. He said, did you get divorced?
So now this you boy, live in the same like, house? yeah, this, something like, this boy <laughs> yeah. was like, "What is going on?" He said, "Rabbi, I, I don't get it." He said, I, I, "I'm just being like you." The rabbi turns to him and he says, "It's impossible that you don't disagree. It's impossible that you see eye to eye with everything from with your wife." He said, "You're a man; she's a woman. You're from that neighborhood." She's from that neighborhood. You're from this family. She's from that family. How in the world don't you have different experiences in the course of your day? How is it possible that you see eye to eye and everything you never disagree? So the boy said, but Rabbi, I'm just being like you. I'm trying to be like my mentor, my teacher. Yeah, you said, you that, you said that you never had anything to ask forgiveness for from your wife. So he said, I said I don't have to ask forgiveness. But I never said we didn't disagree. We disagreed all the time. The question is, how do you disagree? Any person you have a relationship with is different than you, and you're going to disagree. When you disagree, you don't ignore them, you don't yell at them, you don't stonewall. It's how you disagree. I just said, I don't have to forgive this, because when we disagreed often, we did it in appropriate ways. And if someone doesn't disagree with someone else in their relationship ever, then that really means that they're shutting up and they're not allowing themselves to be expressive. They're scared. If I state my opinion, what's he going to say about me? What's he going to think of me? What's he going to say to me? So they shut up. And then it's as if he, she's dead. It's as if you're divorced. We have to realize in all our relationships, we're different. We're different human beings. God made us that way. And we have to make sure that we allow the other person to share and express what they feel, their emotions, their experiences. So we can connect with them and build in the way that we want to build a relationship. Right. When, when we focus in on a little, but why would a God have created people like this? Why make yeah. it, why let's make, make it all so, the same. Just, it's been easy. Yeah. Let's, why can't the world just see the, why can't you just see things correctly? You know, the way I see it, you know, like why, why doesn't everybody see the way I see it? I, I think that uh, it's important to note. Adam la'amal yulad, which means a man is created in order to toil and to grow. We're here to grow. And if there's never any sort of contention, if there's never any sort of friction, there's never the ability for growth. First of all, we don't want to all be the same. Nobody wants to be the same. We want to be able to have interactions which are going to be different, which we're, we're going to be able to communicate different concepts and ideas and see the world differently. That's what makes the world interesting. It would be boring if we had the same thing. But, but beyond that is, is the ability to be able to grow, is to go beyond ourselves. And therefore, we're going to go through circumstances where there are going to be people that are challenging. And the question is, what do we do with that? I would never have to think about how to give to the person. I'd really be giving to you because you're me. <laughs> it's just, I, you like chocolate ice cream? Of course you love chocolate ice cream. So I'm just getting, exactly. So the only way that I could develop myself as a selfless individual is that I have to think. I have to work hard, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. I have to work, get into your psyche. What makes you tick? What triggers you? It's what hard. makes you Can happy? I share that it's hard. It's not easy. <laughs> no, it's not easy. But that's the beauty of relationships. Well, and the more I should say this, it's hard. It's hard. It's very it hard. Is. But the more yeah, that you do it, else. the more that you do it, that's the beauty of the relationship. That's how the love is developed. It, like the word "have" means to give in Hebrew, but it's also the root of the word "ahava" of love. That when I'm able to give, and not just give a present give in significant ways, really thinking about what the person wants and needs, how they want to hear it. You're giving of yourself. You're, you're the whole thing. So that develops the love, that develops the unity and the connection. And that's something that we're striving for. So it's a present that we're not all the same. It's a present. Because yeah. it, it allows us to have that challenge that will allow us to become like the greatest of the great, to be like God himself. Everyone wants to be great. We're all striving to be great people. The question is, what is a great person? The definition of gadol, of greatness, is someone who gives to people that are needy, that are, is reaching out, trying to help those who need their help. So that's the difference between someone who's great and someone who's ordinary. Someone who's giving and caring and trying to take care of other people, that is a great person. And we all have to try to emulate that. God is always giving to us. Non-stop, no matter what. He's giving and giving in this situation, in that situation, and we want to strive for nothing less. We want to be as great as that. But at the same time, we have to realize 
my wife likes to call it the martyr syndrome. Sometimes someone just pushes himself and pushes to give gives, and gives, to give gives, exactly gives. at no end all night, right? And then afterwards, I don't need anything. Yeah, Sorry. exactly. They're perfect. Exactly. And then afterwards, they resent it. I worked so hard. Nobody gave me. Why don't they realize it? How come I didn't get a present? No recognition. Of course, I don't need recognition. Right. But why don't they at least tell me thank you, right? And then I'll say I don't need it. Exactly. <laughs> so that that martyr syndrome is dangerous. If you feel that at the end of the day, that's what you're going to experience and feel after you've given what you've given, then that you should know is a red line. That means that that's too much for you. Now, you could try to work towards more and greater, and, and we could always develop and become, become better givers. And that's something we should strive for our whole life. But a litmus test is, what are we going to feel afterwards? I could say for myself over the years, and what I see with speaking to many people as well, that the certain feeling of inadequacy, like I'm not doing as much as I can be doing, and look how people are doing such great things. It's very important to take a, take a step back and think. You're, you're looking sometimes at a finished product. You're looking at a person, you're not seeing the steps that they took to get there. All you're seeing is the end result. That you're looking at a person that's worked on, that took time, that took years to actually get to where they're at. So yeah, we can get there too. We can get there too. But at the same time, we have to stop comparing ourselves to everyone else. Exactly. It's not about comparing exactly. ourselves to everyone else. It, it, it's about, yes, let's learn from their experiences. And, and that can be a benchmark of something that I look up to that I'd like to get to. But it, it, that, that's not me. They are them. I am me. And I have, to, I have to do what's the greatest thing for me. We have a tendency very often to forget about what we're doing on a day in and day out basis. And many of us are doing great things all the time. But because it's not flashy and no one knows about it, it's not getting the recognition that is energizing us. So sometimes we have to make mental notes or sometimes even write it down on paper. Look at amazing things that I did. Look at all the positive things that I accomplished today. I am great. Can I do something else? Let me see. Can I do it or can I do it? And we should always be pushing ourselves. But it should never be at the expense of focusing on what I'm doing on a day in and day out basis. You know, sometimes you hear these stories about these great tzaddikim doing amazing things in the world and it can make you feel bad about yourself. But one of my favorite stories is Rav Zusha. Someone came up to Rav Zusha and said, Hey Rav Zusha, would you like to change places with Avram, Abraham? He was so great and you're a, do you want to change places? And he said, well, how would that help God? He'd still only have one Rav Zusha and one Abraham and he needs us both. I can do things that he can't do. He can do things I can't do. So when I go to heaven, God's not going to say to me, why weren't you like Abraham? He's going to say, why weren't you like Rav Zusha? So we all have to know what we have to contribute. And we know we don't have to be like other these great people. And maybe we've got something to offer that they don't have. You know, all this talk about being giving and relationships, it's all nice in theory. But practically, people do not want to be taken advantage of. Mm. And it often comes up like, OK, if I'm going to stretch and become that better version of myself, I might also become a doormat along yeah. the way. And I don't really want to be a doormat. So what do you have to say about that? So I'm going to go back to the gym just for one second, because hey. not because I think that you I'm going to start training with you after this. <laughs> <laughs> not because I think that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's I think that there's a real important lesson here. I think that Again, if I'd go to a personal trainer that would now put on 30 kilos for me, then I'm not going to go back to that personal trainer because he didn't understand what my needs were and what my abilities were. I think the idea is to be inspired and not threatened by it and not intimidated Beautiful. and not overwhelmed. How do I get inspiration mm -hmm. without intimidation? Mm -hmm. By reading one of those stories and being moved by it and saying, OK, how does this apply to my life in some kind of little way? Meaning, where's my point where I could go up a notch and be that much better as a person? I may never be that person, but you that they meant, are. You I'm not meant, meant to be. Meant to be. And I once read this great quote that spiritual growth is measured by distance covered and not by destination reached. Yes. And I think that that's coming from someone called Bacha Galant. That's a, that, I always think about that. It's distance covered. It's where I'm coming from to where I need to get to. But not destination reach. I'm not going to be that mm -hmm. unbelievable person, but I'm going to be inspired by her. And my life is going to be that much better because of that story that I read or, or, or whatever that is. Part of what we're trying to do is we're trying to role model healthy giving. Yeah. It's not attractive to anybody when they meet somebody who is just 
turn yeah. themselves into a dish rag and is not, when they see that you are a real giver, but that you know also how, what your boundaries are, there's something about that that inspires other people to want to follow you. Mm -hmm. Think about the people who are role models to us. They're givers, but they also had backbone when they had to. And I was once taught this by a, a family friend of mine who's a psychiatrist. He said a really good question to ask yourself and ask others is what's your default mood, m word? Is mm -hmm. it that I just say yes or I just say no? Mm -hmm. And the Torah has different messages for different people. Yeah. For the people whose message is always I just say no, meaning they're very focused on self-protection, self-nurturance, they have to know that they were put in this world to make life better for other people. Right. And if your default mode is just say yes to everything, you might have to realize that at some point your yes is saying no to somebody and right. often somebody dear to you. So it's just that self-awareness of yeah. where am I coming from here? Where, what are the boundaries? But there's something beautifully inspiring about somebody who can take care of the whole world, but they're also popular among their own loved ones because mm -hmm. they don't want to close the door sometimes. Yeah. And I think that that's really important. Okay, I have a life hack for you. You should just do this now. Trust me, you're going to thank me later. What if I told you that I can guarantee you a mitzvah, a good deed, every single day? It would take no time. It would take zero effort. And it would only cost you $1 a day. Would you be interested? Are you a giver, a daily giver? I know I am. Every single day I give to charity. How, you ask? I'll tell you how. There's an amazing organization called Daily Giving. Daily Giving is the Jewish people's collective tzedakah box. Every day we give one dollar, and together those dollars are pooled in order to make a huge impact. Every single individual gives half a shekel, the rich and the poor, because everyone together is a part in making the change. And it always bothered me, how come we don't have half a shekel concept today? And then I was introduced to something amazing called dailygiving.org. A hundred percent of every dollar you give every day goes to help these organizations. A contribution to Daily Giving is also in support of Camp Hask, providing support and services for hundreds of individuals with specialized needs and their families during the summer and throughout the year. For a dollar a day, you can take part in the magic here too. This is equipment that is crucial for saving lives. We wouldn't have had all this without support from Daily Giving. When you sign up for Daily Giving, you're not just helping one organization, you're helping over 75 different incredible Jewish nonprofits across a diversified portfolio of different needs. We started in 2019, and we've already distributed over $10 million. We're now giving out over $5 million a year we know that tzedakah tatzil mi mavet, tzedakah can save one's life from death, and we know so many countless reasons why giving tzedakah brings more blessings and more shmira, protection, into our lives. So I said, you know what? Let me just sign up my kids as well. To give a dollar a day is not asking too much, and if you can do it, you'll be a good to give No matter what's going on, every single day I know that I've given something. It's the one email I always read. It makes me feel like I actually gave that day. When it comes to tzedakah, every penny counts. I'm not that old, but I remember the days that you can get a slice of pizza for a dollar. Today, what can you get for a dollar? But when you put all of our dollars together, all of a sudden the dollar becomes huge. So that is your life hack. Go now to dailygiving.org, sign up. You're going to get those emails. They're going to make your day. Go check it online right now. Look at the calendar you will see. Every dollar that's given goes directly to another organization. How do you get the biggest bang out of your buck, out of your dollar? It's called dailygiving.org. I find that when people are dealing with others who are difficult, their agenda is to continue to try to get the other person to see why they are right. So they continue to push and try to, I need to be understood, I need him to understand me, I need to, to agree with me, and he keeps on pushing and pushing and pushing. And sometimes, like Rousseau Salantra said, if you change yourself, you could change the whole world. Sometimes a shift in your own mindset could change the whole dynamic of this difficult relationship. 
sometimes when I'm just keep on pushing the, the, the envelope, I'm pushing and pushing, that he has to understand me, I'm just making it worse. I'm making this bad relationship much worse. So there are two things that I try to do in order to uh, change that. One is I work on myself to be more patient, to be more understanding, to be more calm around that person when they're pushing my buttons. And all of a sudden, if my energy changes, that could change the other person and how they're dealing with me as well. And the second, and this is the most important, I think, is I have to change my expectations from the relationship. If I don't expect that the other person actually understands me, I don't expect that he'll hear me out, Okay, it's, it's not working. He's a difficult I'm person. I'm coming in expecting they're going to behave a certain way. Exactly. And then they don't I, live up to my and, and then I keep on being more and more <laughs> upset and then feeling that he's even worse than he really is, right? But if I just drop my expectations, again, you could try, but at a certain point you say, you know what, this isn't going. This person is difficult. So my expectations in this relationship are now different. I recalibrate. And then I'm able to function much better in that relationship. Sometimes when we look at people that are so difficult, these people are so difficult, like you were mentioning Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, the great holy rabbi, we look at them, they're so difficult. Is it possible that maybe we're the difficult ones? Maybe, I'm not saying that they're not, they may also be, but like you said, maybe if we would change our perspective, maybe we're being so stubborn in the way we want it to go and try lower the expectations, drop the expectations, it'll change everything. Says Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, if we fix ourselves, start with ourselves, then we have the ability to now change the entire world. Why? Because immediately our perspective changes and the whole world immediately changes. Beautiful. I don't want it to sound like this is like, oh, you know, yeah, we're experts. I mean, you might be, but I, you know, so like, I can talk. This is very hard. This is, this is challenging. Yeah. But if we're willing, again, to take just a step back and think, they're being stubborn. Am I being in a certain way? They're very difficult. Am I difficult? And if I would change the way I am behaving, maybe they would reciprocate without even realizing they're going to have to reciprocate. Nice. Yeah, sometimes people uh, feel guilty. You know, they come say, oh, this person's an impossible person and, and you know, I, 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 I struggle so much with them. And what should I do? And sorry if this doesn't, this doesn't sound uh, inspiring, but I, I tell them, listen, who says that you're obligated to get beaten down by an obnoxious person? Who says? Where is I don't think it says that in the Torah, right? If, if someone is a toxic person, I, I don't think that you're obligated to be uh, insulted and offended and again and again, right? There's, there's, there's a mitzvah not to take revenge, and there's a Jewish concept of not to be cruel and rude, but there is no... Jewish law that says you're obligated to be insulted. So it's okay to keep your distance from a toxic person. I always learned in martial arts, in every area of, of life, there are three things you can do in a difficult situation. You have a difficult boss, you have a difficult child, three things you can do. Number one is try and change that person. Go up to them and say, look, I don't like how you're treating me. It's just not working for me. That usually doesn't work. The second one is leave the situation. If you can't deal with that situation, just get out of there. If it's a toxic situation, a toxic relationship, get out of there. Sometimes you can't do that if you need the job or it's your child. The third one is to change yourself. To say, okay, how can I learn to be more patient and more loving? So what we need to do is not take it personally, nothing to do with me, and try and have some compassion for them. You have to have a very strong sense of self first, not to take on other people's negativity. Today, there's a growing number of really difficult people. And when I educate my students these days, I talk a lot about psychoeducation, understanding personality disorders, mm -hmm. understanding the people who just, um, they get under our skin and we're not that kind of person. If you're the kind of person who's generally really easygoing and somebody just like triggers you, very often there's something going on with them. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, oh no, what's wrong with me? Right. But they're, you know, so we have to know how to deal with these people. I'd venture to say that most of us have people like this in our lives, mm -hmm. whether it's someone in the family or a neighbor or someone at the workplace who's just very, very triggering. Okay, so I'd like to mention a certain tip that I always say to, um, to people about these kind of people. When you're dealing with a really difficult person, your self-evaluation um, as to whether you're not doing a good job with them or not is going to have to be measured vertically and not horizontally. 
What do I mean? Okay. With regular healthy people, if I am being good to you and you're appreciative, you're smiling, you seem happy with me, I know I'm doing a good job. That's called a horizontal relationship. When you're dealing with a really difficult person, it's going to be vertical. Mm -hmm. Meaning, God, how much effort am I supposed to be put in into this idea, into this relationship? Because I'm never going to get the smile or the thank right. you or the appreciation from that person. And yet I do want to invest. I do want to be a good person. But I'm going to need to say, you know what? I call that person once a week to see how they're doing. Mm -hmm. And even though they're going to make me feel guilty that I don't call them five times a day, I know that I'm doing the right thing. Gets back to our boundary topic. And some of these relationships, honestly, Shifi, sometimes need even more boundaries than that. Because if it's very toxic and it's yeah. really affecting me badly, I might have to, um, I might have to re constantly yeah. what it is to be good to this person. Rebbe, what if you find yourself in a position where you just don't feel like it? You, you want to love, but it, it's too hard. You want to open up your home, you just can't do it. Listen, first you got to work on it. But until you do, to go ahead and go out of your way to help people when you really are developing more and more resentment and you're going to hate them more, don't do it. Don't do it. I'm not saying hate. I'm not saying say nasty words. But to go and put yourself out for somebody when you really, you're really not feeling good about it is going to be destructive. You've got to do your inner work. Until you get there, be careful. Not if it's going to cause resentment. If it's nothing too big, give it a try. Give it a try. But if you know this is going to really get you down, you're going to end up hating the person more. It's going to be so much more difficult to develop a real love for the person. Don't do it. I don't want to sound archaic. First thing I say is throw away your phone. But we're not, Rebbe. If that's not, if you're not so real, if that's not <laughs> so real, if that doesn't work for you, if that doesn't work for you, shut it when you come home. What's the definition of relationship? It means emotional intimacy. That we actually feel connected and loving and what that takes is spending real time together. Speaking, sharing our emotions, sharing our dreams, sharing our thoughts. So obviously, I went to a restaurant, happens often, you have two people in a restaurant and they're looking at their phones and they're not really communicating. So one thing would obviously be if we want any quality time is to put our phones away and I go for a walk in the park with my wife. We have once a week, we go for a walk in the park in the morning and we go to the, a restaurant once a week. So we're making sure if you value something enough, you will put in the effort to do it. So if you value money enough, you're going to put in the effort to get money. I actually heard a famous story, a man wanted to make $20 million and he started working and he was never at home, missed his children's birthday parties and after five years he made $10 million and he was never there and a rich man came up to him and said, look you want $20 million, I'll give you $10 million, I'll give you $10 million but for one of your children, I want to buy one of your children for $10 million, then you'll have all the money and the man said, are you crazy, do you think I'd sell my children for $10 million and the other guy said to him, you already have. Because the money was important. So if your phone is more important than your kids, if money is more important than your kids, then that's what you'll invest in. But once you understand your kids are more important, I have to read my kids a bedtime story. So I'm not bringing my phone into the, my kid's bedroom. I don't care if it's ringing, I'll turn the ring off. But I want to show my kids that I value them and I prioritize them. Therefore, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure I'm present with them in that moment so they feel open to sharing with me. Yeah, I spend a lot of time talking to people about relationships and working with couples, I have to tell you, this is one of the greatest challenges of this generation. It's actually, it's, it's of extreme uh, urgency. It, people think, oh, it's a big deal, my phone, I live in my phone. It's, it's not a joke. When we talk to the people we love, you just can't have, you can't have the screen in, 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 in the room with you. I think a practical tool would be to make times in your calendar and say, look, from 9 o'clock to 9.30, there are no phones. That's our rule. doesn't matter who's going to phone. If it's important, they'll phone back. But we're setting this time of we don't have phones, we don't have books, we don't have newspapers, and we're just going to sit there and be with each other. By the way, this is one of the beautiful things about Shabbat, because on Shabbat, we don't have screens and we don't have stuff going on, so we just get to spend that yeah. quality time with our yeah. family. I saw an amazing stat that says that couples, married couples, 
the amount of time that they actually speak to one another a week. Guess, take, take a guess. What, what do you think? At is, all? Speak, uh, to um, speak about like non-business related matters. They're not speaking about, oh, you pick up the kids today or you go buy me milk or just like they share and they're speaking and they're, it's flowing. How long a week, how much time a week do you think they speak? I think we should cut the tape because I'm nervous <laughs> what the answer is going to be. I'm, I don't know. Not, not a lot. Though, take a guess. We've got to take a guess. Uh, let's say an hour a day. An hour a day. Okay. 45 minutes. 45 minutes a day. Okay. You ready for this? Sitting down? Yeah, that's it. 20 minutes a week. <laughs> 20 <laughs> minutes a week of quality sharing, growth oriented, growth oriented, investing in the relationship, how you feeling, how's it going, what's making you happy. That's it. After all is said and done, if a person can't shut off their phone while they're trying to speak to their wife, their kids, to other people, what that really means is that their phone is more important than their relationship. When you make a move and you say, uh-uh, I'm focused on you, so you're elevating the person that you're speaking to, and you're showing and expressing how important this relationship really is. I, I heard a suggestion once about tefillah from Rabbi Pesach Kron, who said, don't put your phone on vibrate, shut it off. Because even when, you, when your phone is on vibrate, you're still thinking about it and it's still there. It's in your consciousness and, and, and it's hard for a person to focus. I don't think it's even possible for one to focus on two things at once. So in order to be able to focus, we have to be willing to, if not shut it off, put it in a drawer and close the drawer. Look at them, give the attention, give the focus. We're not going to get rid of technology. T -t technology is part of our life. Um, I think it's wrong to push it away all the time because it, it's in our life. What can we do to to make sure that the technology doesn't destroy relationships. Okay, so um, I'd like to say that um, here I, I really recommend for anybody who wants to look into this further, there's a book by Daniel Goleman. Daniel Goleman was the person who created the concept of emotional intelligence. He wrote a book called Social Intelligence and he wrote it in the 1990s, which was before a lot of the more yeah. recent um, you know, technological advances. And he speaks about the concept of the technological snubbing, which is that you know if I see you coming down the street I can make a quick decision whether I'm actually going to greet you and give you a good feeling and wish you a good day or not. I could just like be going like this or going like that or going like there's so many ways that I could just snub you and ignore you. If, we start, if we're talking about unity, we're talking about not looking for opportunities to ignore people because of technology. And I think that that's the first point that we need to make is that technology can be a connector if it's used properly, mm -hmm. but it can literally disconnect us from friends, from loved ones, from ourselves. Completely. And it's so important. For us in 2023, our exercises, where really, but really look into it. Where can I in my life, you know, really physically, you know, fight that urge and, you know, put your phone away. So, you know, you can either, there's so many things, but you know, one of the things, don't plug your phone near your bed. You know, if, if the first thing you look at when you wake up in the morning is your mobile phone, you know, I don't want to say what it is, but you don't have to, you know. Um, you could buy an alarm clock and then put the phone away from your bed. Just little things that is our avoda, is our work, um, to get us to a place where we are more, we interact with each other on a, on, on a more of a, of a human way. Talking about relationships, talking about being human, being about un unity. Um, you know, you can have a hundred people in the room, but they're not together if they're, you know, they're sat on their phones. But again, I, I don't like, putting that down because we live in a world of technology. I think we each have to work on where is it a place where I can, again, find a place where I can work on it enough that's difficult for me, that's a challenge for me, um, but not too hard for me. Know yourself well and, and make sure that you have that time, whether it's with your husband, your wife, your children, have that five minute walk with them where you leave the phone at home, nothing's gonna happen, the world is not gonna end. Um, but it's really hard and I speak for myself, it's not an easy thing to do. The social nuances the what somebody meant by that comment. When the word is sent to you in a text, you don't know, was that said cynically? Was that said <coughs> emphatically? How was that said? And when you interact with people, you, view, you look at their body language, you learn so much more, and it's a use it or lose it skill to have the social intelligence to understand what people mm -hmm. are saying and what they're not saying.
And we in Judaism believe that we, in order to have unity, I need to care about you, I need to understand you, I need to read between the lines what you're saying, what you're not saying, what you mean, what you're going through, what your eyes are telling me about how you feel. Yeah. And all that is, is lost. So there's amazing things that come through technology. Sure. We all realize that. But we don't want to take away from the beauty of the unity yeah. that is formed by real face-to-face -face relationships. Real relationships, yeah. Nobody has to be available 24-6. Nobody. You can't live that way. You can't live, the people don't know each other. I gotta tell you something. You know, we initiated this, and I've heard other, other places have done this too, on our Gesher program at Aish. We initiated an extended weekend trip up north with one catch, no phones. No phones. The parents were informed. The kids were told later. <laughs> the parents were informed. We bring along a videographer so that the parents will be able to get play-by-play. -play. No phones. The students bonded like never before. It was a different life. It was a different life. They matured in a couple of days. They met real human beings and they became real human beings. Everyone's got to try that. Every family's got to do something like that. You want to get to know each other. You want to know your spouse. You want to know your kids. Try some time without the phone and then make it a habit. You come home, no phone. You have some hours, you work at home, wonderful. But you're not sitting there by the phone when you're at home with your family. For heaven's sake, this is your family. What's more important? Your family or anything else, they're on your phone. I don't come, come what may. Yeah. I, b I believe that they're probably, maybe the world will only catch up to what the Rashiva is saying in just a few years, but just like they understood eventually that cigarettes were bad and they banned it from a certain age, they, they will understand that the phones are bad and they're gonna ban it from a certain age. Well, so listen, the communication, uh, it's great. I mean, listen, there's going to come a time not so long from now, for all I know when this is broadcast, uh, where you won't be able to walk into a bank. You know, where, where all business is going to be done online, where, where all shopping is going to be done. Who knows, who knows, who knows? The important thing is that people don't feel that they're addicted to their phones, that they've got to, they've got to see what's going on. They can't feel that way. That's, if this is a culture that's just evil. <laughs> this is a culture that's so destructive. It has gotten rid of the human element in human beings. Relationships are not bad, they're non-existent. They're all artificial. Everyone's busy acting. Real people understanding one another. Come on, it's got to be face to face. It can't be on a device. So at least when you come home, shut it. And be there for your family. Enjoy your family. Get to know your family see the difference. Yeah, I believe that, that this could actually be a game changer for the love that the Rosh Hashiva was speaking about. If we want to love and not hate, we need to be present. And part of that means leaving your phone in the car and not bringing it into the home. Leave it in the glove compartment. Just don't bring it in. And you want to go out to check something, go out, but you realize that it's not part of your home. And definitely even people who do bring it home, I always tell people start with don't bring it into the bedroom. Don't touch your phone for a half hour after you wake up. Wait till after Shachris, if you're praying in the morning. Like the people who right away start with all the information, then they're, they're not in control of their day. So I think it's those small things of like, like the Rashi was saying, not bringing it into the house or making sure not to, to have certain times and hours that it's off limits. Certainly not a dinner. Certainly not a dinner. No. And then we're Zoha to Simen Tovu Mazel Tov. If we're able to... To disconnect, we'll, we'll merit to have a simon tov and a bracha and a rebuilding of the Beis Hamikdash. That's really what we're praying for. Amen. If someone actually hurt us, how do we forgive that person? Should I forgive that person? It, the pain is real. Just like the pain of the destruction is real, the pain in people's lives are real. They, they feel a personal destruction that someone did for them. And there is resentment. They feel the destruction. Their family, their, their, their work. How do we forgive and move on and start rebuilding? Don't do them any favors. Don't do them any favors. 
let go for your own sake. Anger, hatred, these are destructive for ourselves. It's not good for your health. But you want to wake up in the middle of the night with a cold sweat, filled with vengeance? Is that good for you? For your heart, for your digestion? Is that good for you? No one's asking to do them favors. For your own sake, let go. Let go, you can, let go. You need someone to help you work through it, do that. But let go. There's gotta be a conviction for my sake. I want to let go. I don't want to be filled with hatred. I don't want to be upset at people. It's your decision, it's your decision. It's being wise. No, it's not being a doormat, not being a rag. It's being wise. Wow. Somebody once told me that if you're not able to let go, it's like taking the pain of the past, putting it on a knapsack and taking it around with us wherever we go. Instead of just dropping the knapsack and say, I'm letting this go and I'm leaving it behind. And in a certain way, that's what we need to do in order to rebuild. We have to let go of the pain. You know, there's that, that, that old calendar proverb. Anger is punishing yourself for the mistakes of others. Wow. We, we, we gotta realize that. And that's a way to rebuild our relationships, to rebuild our communities, and, re, and the inner rebuilding that we do internally between ourselves, between our homes, in our communities, that is what's going to rebuild the third temple. Yeah, we gotta do it to ourselves and then we have to educate others. We have to pass the word around. Let people know what a happy life you can have. For your own, again, your own sake, we could be so happy. Life is so beautiful without hatred. It starts inside. Yeah. You're not a hero to just swallow it to swallow someone else's misdeed. The, 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 the Torah gives us a commandment which is difficult but wise. And that is if someone wrongs you and hurts you, you should tell them. You should tell them. Don't just say, okay, whatever, I'm gonna swallow it and forget it. No, you should tell them. But for your own sake, to be able to say, okay, this is what I had in my life. How am I going to use this to grow? How can I take the positive from it? Well, it's being real with your emotions and feeling your pain, but to keep thinking over and over again, it's not fair, why me, it's his fault. Right. That's not actually helping you grow in any way. Right. So as you say, either be able to actually forgive or at least to be able to forget it and not to keep mulling over it and over right. it again, because that's gonna make you not be able to move on and live a positive and joyful life. Right, right. So really, what is a practical step to letting go of your pain and your resentment? And there are really three levels. One is to just be a victim and play it over and over again. That doesn't help. The next one is to have a positive attitude, which means this is painful and it's not my fault, but I'm going to use it to grow. I can turn my pain into purpose. So not letting go of my pain, but I'm going to go and be there for other people who also had pain. Then we have a very, very high level, I'm almost scared to mention it, called emuna, And emuna means I trust that actually everything that happens in my life is there to help me grow in some ways. And difficult as it may seem, there is often the biggest challenges in our life and the most painful things in our life that can help us become the greatest people, to really be able to understand other people's pain. So to see it like that, that I don't necessarily need to let go of my pain, but I'm not going to let the pain dictate my life and be a victim to it. I'm going to cry, I'm going to feel it, but then I'm going to ask, how can I use this pain to go and positively empower other people going through the same thing? Is there such a thing as forgive and forget? Can you ever forgive somebody that really harmed you? And I'm talking about like really harmed you. You know, we have a commandment in the Torah where the Torah tells us that we're not allowed to hate our brother in our heart. Now, I want to say that I think that when it doesn't come to the really abusive people, but it comes to the people who've annoyed us and bothered us, um, sometimes we're really sweet outside and we say hello to them and we just like, but in our hearts we are fuming. And the Torah is telling you that that inconsistency is, is, is not allowed. And you know, part of our issue is hate. Hate is a four letter word. None of us hate anybody. But when you look at how the Torah defines hate, it's actually a very interesting definition. 
there is a, a source in Sanhedrin, uh, the rabbis say that if you don't talk to somebody for three days out of animosity, mm -hmm. that is referred to as hatred. Now, it doesn't say if you're trying to work it out. It means that I'm perpetuating a, a, a cycle of hatred and negativity by avoidance. It's so right. interesting. The Torah does not define hate as what you do to somebody physically or verbally. It's the avoidance cycle. Right. It's the Cold War is called hate. So in the regular relationships, we are trying to not avoid people out of animosity, which means be that bigger person, make the phone call, pick up the phone first, ask them for direction somewhere. I just say anything. It doesn't have to be a whole forgiveness thing, but just to try to break that cycle. We know people who've been in family feuds for 20 years because mm -hmm. of some, some fight about a party 20 years ago. And that's that avoidance cycle that this is why the temple was destroyed. When it comes to the topic of abuse, this is not where the Torah expects you to find opportunities to interact with the person. Okay. That's a completely different category. And here we have a concept of a person has to protect himself. And in such a situation where there's a lot of toxicity and, you know, and there's abuse, it is not a, a good thing to find reasons to interact with this person. In, in fact, I could probably love them better from afar mm -hmm. and probably heal more and get to a place where I'm okay with them if I actually have those really enforced boundaries. If people are, you know, as you say, um, been in relationships where they're abusive or it could be, you know, the list, unfortunately, the list is, is, is really, really long um, and painful to hear and to watch. I'm sure you and your work and in my work, you know, as you said, so true. And, and I think it's, it really means a lot is that you have to take care of yourself. And if by taking care of yourself, you need to cut people out of your life, that obviously is not the, 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 the basic um, interaction that we have with people. We cut that one off because they, you know, they spoke badly about me or because they annoyed me or they didn't answer my phone or they didn't buy me a birthday present. We don't, we're not talking about that. We're talking about, obviously, as you say, somebody that's really affected me in a negative way. I can't live a, a, a giving life if I don't take care of that. And then therefore the compassion is so important. The self-care is, is so critical um, for myself and therefore for the others around me. Completely, completely. When a person bears a grudge, when we hold on to these feelings, these negative feelings towards someone else, it's like letting somebody live in your head rent free. Oh wow. You stop and think about, they don't even know, like you said, they don't even know you're upset at them. You don't even tell them and, and we go on like, I'm gonna, sh I'll get them and, and we just suffer, we continue to suffer. It's, it's really simply not worth it. Yeah. I guess the question though is practically, practically speaking, what can somebody do if they are in a situation like this in order to maybe to have a different perspective, to be able to, 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 to remove those negative feelings? So one idea that I've tried to use and uh, I've seen other people use, this doesn't work in every single case, uh, but a lot of times when someone wrongs us, they do something to upset us, that's not really who they are. Right? Inherently, they're a very good person. They're well-intentioned. In general, they're good. They're doing good things. Here, they made a mistake. They, they did something off the mark. And, okay, I was uh, unfortunately the one who, who got it. But when I start feeling that negative emotion, so all of a sudden, I'm describing that person as, that's who they are. They're terrible. They're mean. They speak not nicely. They're inconsiderate. And I start defining who they are. And once that happens, there's like almost no movement. You can never repair with someone when their, their essence, their essence is just evil. It's just, you're never going to be able to get past that. But when you can look at their essence, the, the, who they are inside, and you can say, you know, really they are a good person. And I can list all the amazing things that they do. Okay, they did this, they borrowed my car and they drove it into a tree. It was an accident, you know. So I'm, I'm upset about it, but I'm upset at the action. I'm not, I'm not upset at who the person is. And when you're able to cipher and, 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 and split those two feelings, a lot of times it's much easier to then reconnect and feel better about that person. I heard a line that uh, somebody shared with me once that was, I didn't get at first. It was, I just didn't understand what they were saying. And, uh, and then, then I had to think until they finally, they, they put a comma and I got it. What they said is hurt people hurt people. Mm. Hurt people, comma, 
hurt people. When somebody is hurting, when someone is themselves not in a great place, they will then go and do that to other people. Like we know, although one would think differently, statistically we know that people who have been through challenges in, in trauma will then pass it on to someone else. You think, why would you do that? You went through it yourself. Okay, long discussion, but we find statistically that is the case. Upwards of 80% of someone who went through a certain trauma will pass it on to someone else. Maybe if we were to just, just switch a little bit of a lens over here, and that is that I don't look at them as, as angry but I look at them with empathy. And I look at them like, why are they behaving like this? There's a reason. People don't just do things for nothing. We gotta figure out where is it coming from that I think that would be the beginning of the process. Let's be, let's be real, let's be honest. I, I've had my own personal experiences of people that were really, it was, it was really hard for me to deal with. But uh, when, when, when you stop and you think about, okay, who knows what they're going through in life? Why did they feel the necessity to do such a thing? that I think that gives a whole new perspective. And although it takes time, we're human, we're human. And when we feel pain, it's very hard to, able to get past that. But once we're able to take a step back, then maybe that will give us the ability to take a step forward. That's very beautiful. I think that's the walk away line from this entire Tish B'Av period. Do you want to hate or do you want to love? And it's really our choice. We could always, at any interaction, do I want to be the type of person who hates people? And that is so, we, no one wants to be a person who walks around bitter and hating. Or do I want to love? We're looking for love, and really we should be giving love, and then we'll get more love. And it's, that's our choice. I think that, that line is, is what really resonates with me. Thank you so much for spending time with us. At H, this is what we do every day. Every single day, we're working on our relationship with the Almighty and with each other. Recently, I was asked on a news program, they said, how can Gentiles help combat anti-Semitism? And I told them, you know what you need to do? Hug a Jew. Find a Jew, give them love, hug them, and tell them we're with you. And I'm telling you, my Jewish brothers and sisters, the exact same thing. You need to walk, walk away and find a fellow Jew to hug. Give them love. Someone you know, someone you don't know, someone you haven't been that friendly with. Tell them how much you appreciate them. That is the message of Aish. It's a message of love. Share this program with them. Encourage other people to listen to what you've learned. Help support us. We work around the globe. Millions and millions of Jews are finding their way back to the Almighty online with help from Aish. Please feel free to support us in terms of money, in terms of love, in terms of everything. This is a movement that is way too important to fall by the wayside. Thank you for being with Aish. Thank you for being incredible Jews. Thank you for loving the entire Jewish people. Thank you for loving the Almighty. And God willing, next year, let us rejoice together in a rebuilt temple. We gotta rebuild, we gotta be, rebuild Kali's story, we gotta rebuild the nation. And it's not gonna happen until every one of us on a personal level learns to think differently. Yeah. Takes control of himself. Unless we're willing to change ourselves, we can't talk about making any difference in the Jewish nation. It starts at home. It starts with the family, it starts with the neighbors, it starts within the community. Then we can talk about the bigger picture. I know people, you know, let's make these big, get together, these unity meetings. And if you can't get along with your friends, your family, your neighbors, then there's no hope for the Jewish nation. It's got to start there. The Gemara relates that the temple was destroyed because of Kamtzer and Bar Kamtzer. Ah, we had this guy, his friend was Kamtzer, his enemy was Bar Kamtzer. He invited Kamtzer to come to his dinner there. And instead, the messenger went and invited Bar Kamsa. And he threw him out. He threw him out. And this Bar Kamsa begged, I'll pay for my portion. No, I'll pay for the whole meal. No, out, out, out. And no one protested. 
So this Baal Kamitsa went and he convinced the Romans that the Jews had begun a rebellion. And that was the beginning of the destruction. Wow. So the Gemara tells us it's because of Kamitsa and Baal Kamitsa. The Maral asks a question. We understand that it was because of the story of Bar Kamitsa. It was because of Bar Kamitsa. What's, what's Kamitsa's point? Why is Kamitsa? Why is Kamitsa mentioned there? It's Bar Kamitsa. He was the one that went and, and, and claimed we were rebelling. What's with Kamitsa? See, he says it's the culture. The fact that you have a circle of friends that's exclusive and those are the people outside my circle. These are friends, mm. these are enemies. That culture is dangerous. Wow. That culture is destructive. That culture brings destruction. Wow. It's the Kamtsa Bar Kamtsa syndrome. It's the friend and foe. That, that's what brings destruction. Even the friend who wasn't even at the party because he didn't even realize he was invited. He was supposed to be the one who was invited. Yeah, but he, he allowed but, himself to be the friend. But then he allowed himself to be the friend he in that culture him. of the inner club. Yeah. That's what ruins it. It's amazing how the lessons of the destruction of 2,000 years ago are the same lessons that speak to us today. Nothing's changed. The human personality has not changed. We've got the same struggles. We've got the same, you know, we spoke about technology. Okay, of course, the venues are different. The details are different. At the core, it's the same thing. Same thing. We'd rather stick to ourselves. We'd rather see the world the way we want to. We'd rather deal with people that are like-minded. Nothing's changed. We've got to make a change. We have to make a change. We've got to make a change. We have to change things. Every one of us, just take upon yourself. Maybe start with one, one bad relationship that you accept upon yourself. You're going to make this work. Start with that one. And then don't just end with that one. And continue. And then bring your friends into this. Let it spread. Let it spread. Start something. You never know what a difference it's going to make. Next year, it may not look like this anymore. Next year, we'll see an entirely different image, but it's not just the building, like the, the Rashida nation, said. The, the nation, Jewish the entire nation. J Jewish people will be here. Yeah. A big schus, Rebbe. Yeah. We should marry it. We should marry it for the rebuilding of the base of Mikdash. Amen. Amen.